We're on the east bank of the Mississippi River. It's March 31st, 2011. We're going into the boat harbor at Point Alahatch on the east bank. Point Alahatch, Louisiana. Let's see if we can talk to a couple of fishermen about what they're experiencing in the claims process with BP oil trying to recover what they lost last summer 10 months ago in the BP oil spill. My name is Vlaho Mihovic. I've been a commercial oyster fisherman for about 23 years right now. That's all I've done. Um, these three boats behind me are mine. And uh, I'm like a third generation oyster fisherman. And uh, I started out with my dad. And I'm kind of taking over over the business. And everything was fine until the oil spill came. I haven't worked since um, oyster and uh, since uh, dredging since April 1st. April, April, back in April. I haven't been dredging. So that's almost like 10, 11 months. Yes, 10, 11 months I haven't worked just due to the oil spill. It's just, it's very, you know, right now there's no market. Our season was the first time in my, you know, I ever seen the season not open due to the oil spill because they pumped a lot of fresh water out there to keep the oil from coming in from the river. And that killed a lot of the oysters. There's no spats. There's very few oysters out there and they want to leave that alone, let it reproduce for next year more produce for next year and the wildlife has refused three on three occasions when uh, there was certain people wanted open they refused okay um, you say you haven't worked for almost a year um, it's still costing you to live you got a mortgage you got the notes on some of your equipment exactly uh, um, I still have expenses uh, coming up to, uh, shipyards coming up for these boats to uh, I have to get up and clean them and do some work on them and that's costing me money. I gotta use my savings right now. And I'm putting money in both so I have you know I can't go to work tomorrow with right now. Can you give me an idea what your expenses might be like? Like what does a propeller cost you for example? A propeller for one of these boats is anywhere from twenty five hundred to three thousand depends if you material if you get one of stainless or a nine brow brass the three types we use. A clutch I just rebuilt the clutch in one of the boats it was sixty five hundred dollars. The winches are, you know, have to be overhauled. They just can't sit. It's machinery. You can't leave it to sit. You know, you have to use it. That's the worst thing you can do. These boats, uh, these two behind me have Detroit Motors uh, 671 series, and those motors go back to the landing craft in World War II. They're, uh, they're, those are the same types, but these are different designs. Same type of original motors that were used and the types, you know, it's a 50-year-old design motor. They don't make them anymore, and it's, it was a good quality motor. I mean, you don't have to do much to them. You can, you can basically run them on Crisco oil if you wanted to. Yeah, but if They're, you have a problem with them, like, uh, say, a major yeah. uh, cylinder problem or, or uh, uh, anything like that, uh, uh, how much does it cost to rebuild uh, or uh, to, get a new one? To rebuild one of these, you're looking at anywhere from, depends if your core is good, you can get an exchange. You're looking from nine to 15,000, rebuild. That's a rebuild motor. A new one with this many horsepower costs you from twenty-five to forty thousand dollars. Depends what depends what you want. You know what kind of brand. How much does it uh, cost you to operate these boats? Right now, with the prices, if you go wide open, depends how I run them. You're looking at anywhere from five hundred to nine hundred dollars a week. You know, you're looking at about four, four to five thousand a month right now. The way the fuel went up. Just for fuel. Yes, yeah, just for fuel. That's before you get your deck hands. You pay yourself. You pay your deck hands and your other uh, overhead that uh, yes. you might be incurred. Yeah, maintenance and deck hands repairs. I mean, it, it just adds up, and you put money in a boat and a business that really you can't go work tomorrow. And, and these emergency payments, are they large? Are they enough to keep you going for several months? Or what? Well, yeah, they, they, you know, some people got a good bit, some people, you know, got a little bit. I mean, it's not, it's not, the emergency payment was for a six months payment. It was good, for, you know, that was back in uh, October. I mean, it's better than nothing. It's months already now. I mean, what are you going to give you now? I mean, 
They don't explain to you. They had the formula on the internet of how your claim was going to be processed and everything, the years and whatever, and how they're going to do it and change things around. And then they opened the. This was the first year that the season was not open. The Department of Wildlife officials refused to open our season. The season begins September and ends in April. Uh -huh. First year ever, the season was closed because of the impact of the oil on the sea. So that's a whole year's income, basically, for I, an oyster yeah, man. Yeah, I couldn't work if I wanted to work. They, 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 we had no season this year. Your ship, your boats are set up for oysters, not for shrimp, not no. for uh, uh, crabbing or anything, no, right? I can't do anything about fish oysters, the way they design. A lot of, a lot of deck on them, and they slow and heavy. They just uh -huh. made to go out there and catch one thing, oysters. I see. You can them up for shrimping, but that, you know, I never did that. I mean, I, I'm wasting my time and my money. Okay, let me ask you this question, young man. Uh, currently, Kenneth Feinberg and Gulf Coast Claim Facility is offering a uh, check of $25,000 for a small boat owner to settle and agree not to sue. Do you think that's a fair offer to the small boat owners? No, I think that's an insult. I mean, the, the, those offers were just, you know, that's about the only thing they're paying off right now at this time, you know, quick. And it's just a waiting game. They're not, you know, doing the other claims. they put putting those on a back burner. And, I mean, that doesn't cover anything. I mean, it's a small, you know, they want, I guess, that, that offer was established by them. So they give her some of these people that jumped on the bandwagon in the beginning, which is, you know, might be good for some people, but for us it's an insult. I mean, it yeah. doesn't cover anything. I mean, our, you know, you just want to get people sign off and you're not signing off, and you sign your rights away, not just to sue BP, but to sue every other contract and subcontract they had out there with Transocean, uh -huh. Hall, Hall, uh, Halliburton and um, the rest of them, even the catering companies that served them food out there, you, you're giving your rights away. It's not, I mean, it's a lot of, I mean, we don't even know who's responsible for the spill right now. Uh -huh. You know, was it, which, you know, BP has taken the blame because it was their well, but, you know, what machinery failed and they're amongst themselves going to have to sell this, you know, this, this thing, you know, whose, whose fault it is, but I mean, they basically, they want it done, and the fast as they can get it done, the better there it is for them to operate. And uh, the offers they're offering, you know, the government should have got on them for some of the stuff they did. But. Uh, let me, can you comment a little bit on your own personal claim experience? I understand you recently put in your claim. Yes, uh, I mean, I had I received a mercy payment in the beginning, and, you know, that helped me out, but I still, you know, have a family, you have these boats, that's that's like, you know, it's like your family too, you gotta take care of them, spend money on them, and now it's just, you know, now, uh, in the back of my mind, I think we're going, is it because it's been a year now away from the spill, are things going to be, going to be treated the same as they were in the beginning, or are they going to make everything right? You don't hear that anymore, I mean. Yeah, you don't hear that at all. Make everything right, you know, in the beginning it was just, National media was on, everything was, you know, and, um, you know, I haven't worked since April. I mean, nothing's been right for me. It's just, you know, make it right how, you know, yeah. make it their PR look good. Are they going to pay you for all the stress and the sleep you've lost night after night? You got to wonder. And, and, and are they going to pay the note in your house, the boats, you know? Uh, um, I mean, uh, you know, the real fishermen are not getting what they deserve. I mean, I know, I don't know any one of them that got their final settlement yet. Okay, so, uh, and the condition of your fisheries, uh, I understand they had to pump a lot of fresh water into the oyster beds to prevent the uh, encroachment of the oil during the spill, and that has resulted in a lot of the oysters dying. Uh, can you explain uh, how uh, that is impacting on your ability, even if they open the season, it sounds like there wouldn't be much production. Exactly, they kill a lot of the small oysters, we call them spats. And it takes an oyster anywhere from two to three years to mature, so it's uh, sa uh, for sa saleable. So the small ones are all wiped out because they pump the water in the spill in the summer months when the oysters need salt water for them to survive. In the winter, they can they got, they're more healthier, they're more fatter. They can take fresh water. In the summer months, the heat, 
and the fresh water that was out there and no salt, that, that wiped them out. I mean, I've seen oysters come up just, you know, days old, they were dead, hang out the shell, you know, and it was just terrible. It was just disgusting to see all that. I couldn't find one live oyster, you know, in the dredge, and uh, it wasn't um, stuff I only seen from hard rain before it happened in certain areas, but this was a wide area where I went out there and seen. What do you think, uh, do you think BP has uh, uh, been treating the people of Louisiana fairly? What percentage of the people of Louisiana have actually made final settlements, would you say? Well, some of the people that got tired of waiting, you know, had no choice. You know, I have a friend of mine, he just got tired of waiting, and he just went for 25000 because his bills were just going to take his house from him and his car, and he had no choice, and he had to do it. You know, some people had the means, you know, they could wait and stand by, and, but some, you know, it depends. You know, I think it, it can go on like this forever for, for anybody. What about the uh, people that you know, you know, the fishermen that are in, here we are, uh, what's the name of this boat harbor? Point La Hash Marina. And, and this is what I'm doing? Uh, Mostly oyster fishermen here, some shrimpers and a few crab fishermen. And, and this is on the east bank of the Mississippi River yes. in Plaquemine Parish, This right? is on the east bank of the Mississippi River. It's been here since 1973. It's been you know, a good place to work out of, good harbor. People did good around here you know, over the years. I mean, Katrina wiped us out. No, none of the boats in this marina made it. They all got washed away. They had 25 feet of water. People came back, rebuilt. For what? Now we got to deal with this oil spill. And people, you know, they don't understand. They make BP's putting commercials out there. It's all fine and dandy, but it's not. I mean, it's a year now. It's the same thing. It's, it's, it actually got worse for me than it was, you know, when it first occurred. It was, you know, it was beyond comprehend, you know, where it was happening was out there. It was far away. It had an impact, you know, what they did with the water, the fresh water, and, and everything else. It changed, flipped my world around. Uh, I understand uh, you mentioned earlier that you did get some work from BP during the cleanup. Uh, how uh, how much work did you get from them? Yeah, I got a few days in. It wasn't much that other people did. I have three boats, only one I was able to get on at the end of the process. I, I should have got on the beginning, but I got on at the end, and it was just, you know, people, they had too many people at the end. I mean, they had more boats than they can do what they can do with, and they were getting rid of boats, and I just... Got on two shifts, two times, and that was it. It was over. So, so that's last, only a couple of days' work, really. Yeah, a couple of days' work, and uh, it was, you know, it was interesting work. I mean, I was in the river, bringing water and Gatorade 25 miles up and down the river, uh -huh. dodging uh, cargo ships coming up and down the river. They, 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 they um, these boats don't go that fast, and with the current in the river. Uh, it, it's it was I was, my speed was cut in half coming up the current. I bet I bet because you were spending twice as much on fuel. Yes, uh, but the, the river, the current, no, the current in the river was so fast. It, oh, it just, your speed was cut. Speed half. was cut in half. I mean, see. Going down, it was fine. It would take me my destination where I had to go. It would take me three hours to go down, and it would take me about seven, eight hours to come back up to to the base where I was leaving from. And, and your experience on the oil spill cleanup, uh, a lot of people told me that they were just spotting in uh, the oil, but they were told not to touch it. They didn't actually physically pick it up, but what was going on was that they were putting uh, uh, the coordinates down from the GPS and then uh, giving that information to BP so that they could uh, uh, aerial spray at night in order to hide the corrects yes. that the dispersant was. Uh, did you see anybody actually cleaning up oil physically, or was it more just spotting oil? Uh, the first thing I did, I was just in the river, up and down. The second thing, I was out there uh, on the beach where they were cleaning up the tar balls that were coming up. And, I mean, you couldn't tell. You could be walking over these things. They look like soft mud. I mean, more or less, for best, you know, dog pool. They look like dog pool out there. And it was just, you know, solid. And it just it didn't look like oil. It looked like, like tar. I mean, it like mud and tar. Yeah. And those guys were shoveling that into bags and putting it, you know, they were showing it to me where it was and stuff and watch it, you know. And um, in the mornings you see a lot of it. Certain areas they would spot and they were doing a good job cleaning it up. It was a beach out there. It was beautiful. It was, uh, you know, it was a remote beach. You could only get there by boat. And it was a barrier island. And people used to come out there and fish and camp in the, you know, in the summer. 
if camps out there, it was just terrible how it was going. And I seen a, a dead shark and a, a sperm whale, a baby sperm whale was dead out there in that area. They found, they don't know why it died, they never even said, explained it, you know, but it's been documented. All well, it was documented. Did it make know. it in the news, this dead sperm whale? Yes, I see, it, I see it on the internet. They made it on the internet, the fish killed the head, and made it on the, on the news and stuff, but they, they said it was just um, the, the air oxygen, oxygen level killed the fish. And the whale, they don't know how it died, the shark, you know, they, don't, they, they never went further. They just find it documented. It's like, after, I don't hear nothing about it. And then forget about it. Yeah. In, in this harbor here, I think there's 40 or 50 or 60 boats. How many of them actually got to work on this oil spill cleanup? Um, 10. 10? 10 oh, that that's, I know of. That's 10 about boats. 10 boats. 15% of the, the harbor. Yeah, exactly. You know? And the rest of the people uh, mm -hmm. never got called. In the place I worked at, it was mostly uh, recreational fishermen. Their boats, people were buying boats, recreational fishermen signed them off and working. That was that kind of stink. You know, I mean, I seen boats from Florida out there working. Uh -huh. It wasn't, it wasn't fair. Well, there was a lot of boats, uh, uh, local boats that couldn't get jobs, but they were hiring people from out of state. It sounds exactly. Like. I called, you know, had to call, or complain. They just like, yeah, oh, we got you. We'll call you. Just like this claim thing. <laughs> Do you think they're allocating $20 billion to take care of uh, all the Gulf states, not just Louisiana, but uh, Mississippi, Florida, and the other states? Do you think this $20 billion is enough to uh, make people whole from the damages that they've suffered? And do you think that they are uh, sincerely trying to make people whole? No, I don't think that's, you know, it's the whole Gulf area. It's four states, five states you're talking about. And it's not... I don't think it's not even Mexico is a claim. I think. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's enough for future. You know what can happen. I mean, they opened it up. Everybody was affected. Who was? Who, some people were more than others. But um, you know, I mean, they should treat us better. I mean, if this this spill happened anywhere else. I think they would have. They would have done much better. You know, it just. You know, this is this was a British company working in American waters, drilling for oil. That should have been more responsible than uh, you know they were. Let me ask you this question: I talked to oilmen both over in La Rose Galliano and also down in Empire. There are people working in the oil, offshore oil, oil rigs, and they made the claim that uh, BP didn't want to. Uh, cap this well uh, right away because if they did the way the lease is written uh, they and the, if they capped the well and pulled off the hole they no longer had control of the lease it would return to the state of Louisiana or the federal government combination uh, have you heard anything like that that, that uh, BP didn't really want to cap the well I mean it took them 120 days uh, it seemed like pretty simple at the end when they put the uh, valve on it open and then uh, sealed it in and then uh, closed the valve I mean it wasn't rocket science it was I it think took it them 120 days four months 60,000 barrels a day yeah it was the depth of water it was over 5,000 feet and it was you know down there and they try out the stuff where they should have just cut the pipe take the bolts off and put a cap on it but the pressure it weren't about the pressure and the thing blowing up and going all over the place I mean it wasn't you know, it, it was almost like brain surgery, you could say, but they were doing stuff they shouldn't have been doing in the beginning. They should have got on it and hired experts, you know, and, and it's like the government. They will, you know, if BP doesn't do it, the government will take over, but then the government, the Coast Guard, Tad Allen said, you know, who do we replace BP with? There's nobody out there that can do this. I mean, there were not cahoots in the beginning. Yeah, that's it. How did you feel uh, about the fact that BP seemed to be ordering the Plaquemine County Sheriff uh, to keep people away from any site of oil? They seemed to be controlling and giving orders to the Coast Guard in terms of keeping people from witnessing like oil on the beaches, oily uh, birds, that kind of thing. How do you feel as a Louisiana citizen? That's censorship. I mean, they have no rights to do that. I mean, people, this is public area. They got everybody to come and look and take pictures. It's, this isn't, uh, this isn't some, uh, you know, foreign country. This is America. We have rights here. And uh, freedom of speech is one of our, you know, no other country has freedom of speech like this country has. And it has, the history of this country has helped in the past. 
to make it more modern and more advanced than other countries, we can say, you know, but, you know, the censorship and them getting, you know, stopping people. I mean, I've seen people, a woman in Alabama was taking pictures of workers dehydrating on the beach from the cleanup and they didn't want her taking pictures of that worker. I mean, it's just like uh, in a war, they don't want the public seeing people getting shot up or killed. It's all censorship in this country. It's all blocked. And you can never see that on TV. And they went to this extreme in this matter to stop this. It was just, it was, my, it was the only thing I could refer to as like a war. Yeah, okay, you know, talking about the media, BP, uh, by some estimates, has spent almost as much, close to $20 billion, with their national ad campaigns on all major uh, TV outlets, on uh, the advertising they're doing on YouTube uh, itself, as well as uh, all kinds of print media. Uh, estimates are they've spent between 15 and $20 billion, uh, along with their consultants uh, from all over the United States. Uh, do you think that this could have been better allocated to help relieve the suffering among the uh, people that were affected economically, like the fishermen and the fish-related industries in these states? I mean, it's their money. They can do what they want with it. But the way they went about it and spent all this money on this media just shows you how they wanted to protect their image and they wanted to make it look different than it was down here. I mean, you never seen a fisherman get on TV and to that extreme, you know, show him how he was disgusted and how he couldn't make it and this and that but there those commercials were an insult I think using fishermen to go on TV and say everything was right for that fisherman not the rest the, the 3,000 other oyster fishermen that are, that are in this business with me you don't see any of them get on TV and say you know I've been treated right or you know it's just an insult I mean it's just public image you know it's just you know BP wants to be a star and you know and they have done a good job of trying to make them su survive it's a survival mode I mean we're in survival mode mode there have been a survival move from day one of the spill spend their money they can do what they want with it but it's it's insultive you know I've seen stuff on TV where workers were cleaning the beach a woman that was just there on the beach couldn't film them. She they they, they get a police officer chase the woman off the beach because she was filming people doing the cleanup on the beach, a public beach, and BP had to get a police officer to block her. A big old 400-pound police officer get in front of her in a camera to block her from filming the people. F uh, that I mean, why is BP so concerned about their image? I mean, it's just you know, I guess it's all about money. With them, it's just like you know. Well, just like in calm, like calm, a war, you can't show people getting their heads blown off and shot on TV, you know, because it would affect the public. And right. they were out there, put a, I think it was 60 feet or 180 feet, you couldn't come to a woolly bird because uh -huh. you might endanger the bird. You couldn't come over to fil film it or you would get fined. Endanger the bird, that's kind of and weird. Endanger the bird is just like, they didn't really want you filming. And the Coast Guard implemented that. It looks like to me, there was censorship. I mean, you're right. How can a British company come here, censor us? Yeah. I mean, what rights does that give them? And it's all, you know, I mean, like I said, they got money. They, 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 they got all the money in the world. Maybe that's why they had so much power. They wanted to make it look like it wasn't there. They, in the beginning, they never admitted how much oil was being spilled. They never have put, you know, it took, I think, a couple of months for them to figure it out, how much oil was being spilled, and they didn't want to, you know, yeah, and they were it. still saying 15,000 barrels after uh, after two months yeah. a day when uh, they had that uh, tiny little camera down there, and then they put the HD, you know, super high definition camera down there, and they couldn't claim 1,500 barrels uh uh, you know, a day after that, and the scientists figured out it was at least 60,000 barrels a day. Right. They, they didn't want to show what there was, and also the Oil Pollution Act, they, get, they can get fined per barrel for what's coming out of the ground. But they, uh, you know, they, they were protecting themselves and their money and their interests. I mean, you know, it's wrong the way they did it. And, um, you know, they didn't have any government oversight, you know, committees that should look into this. You know, they operate here and they can get away with stuff like this. It's not right. Okay, so among the people you know, the fishermen, the oystermen, and the other fishermen in Plaquemine Parish, for example, uh, how many people would uh, 
uh, as a percentage, say if there's uh, 10,000 uh, people in this industry, just for example, what percentage of those people have received fair settlements from uh, BP? None. I ain't seen anybody get a fair check. I've seen two people, three people. They right now getting desperate. They they sign up for the twenty-five thousand dollars. They just has had enough. They just want that you know, and get away, you know, so they can get on. But, desperate uh, to keep their houses or whatever. Yeah, keep their houses. But uh, you know, the mercy payment. Some in the beginning, you know, some people got it. It was good. Some didn't get anything. Like you thought they were going to get, but it's just not the waiting game. Nobody that I know of has gotten the final to know what they're going to get. As far as your own personal experience, um, like you have put a claim in with BP. Are you able to freely communicate with them and get some straight answers? No. Um, you can call them and they're going to tell you the status of your claim, but they're not going to tell you what they're doing to your claim. You never know that. I guess it's legal. I mean, they don't want to know you know, people to know. Nobody knows the formula they're using to estimate your claim. Nobody knows how they're paying you, what they're paying you for. I mean, it's just, you know, here's, you know, here's your money. If you're happy with it, that's it, you know. Okay, Kenneth Feinberg and the uh, Gulf Coast Claims Facility, uh, do you feel that they have uh, behaved honorably in making these offers that a lot of people consider to be low? Yeah, Kenneth Feinberg, you know, he's can pay very well to protect BP, and then, you know, he's saying he's not working for BP and this and that, which is not, you know, he in the beginning made comments that were not, you know, true, and he should have been, you know, advising people better. He was just trying to make it look like he's not working for BP, he's neutral and this and that, but really he's getting paid by BP, you know, he has government assistance, if he can get anything he wants from the government, to work, you know, with this claim process that he is working for them. It's not, you know, a judge overturned the comment, but he was telling us this just to make it look like, you know, he was working for off himself to help us out. But really, I mean, who's he helping? I mean, you know, right now it's not going it's like it should be. It's pretty obvious he's taking care of BP, but he's not taking care of the small fishermen.